Okay, welcome to the Swedish Junior Hockey Podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Dahlin. Um, originally from Leksand. We will have to say that somehow now I live in the U.S. But uh, today's guest, uh, the J20 uh, national team coach, uh, Jacob Strandberg, from originally from east coast of Sweden in Kalmar. But uh, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Jacob. Nice to nice to be here. This episode is brought to you by Scandlux, your home for Scandinavian luxury products for the U.S. market. You can find us at scandlux.com. Yeah. So, what I thought uh, we talked once offline and and chatted a little bit about video coaching and and video analysis, and that's going to be my main topic. I think it'd be cool to talk about some of the other things too, and and and. Um, the systems and 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 Swedish national team, if we can a little bit, and and not in details, of course, but but um, um, but let's start a little bit about your background because you you know you're not a player anymore. At no, the elite, exactly. at the elite level, I guess I guess your elite prospect profile would say, does it say retired? I don't know if it does, uh, but uh, I definitely don't play anymore. So yeah, it should be. Yeah, it, it it doesn't actually, but um, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm twenty twenty nine years old right now. Uh, guy who loves hockey, and I've been doing that since I was a kid, and always loved many sports. But when I was like fourteen, my dad said to me, "Now you have to choose which sport you want to play," and uh, I chose ice hockey because I thought that was most fun to practice, and I. No, I knew that I had to practice a lot to get somewhere. So that's why I chose ice hockey. And I've been uh, now coaching for the last six years because I uh, stopped playing as a 22-year-old because of injuries and other factors, I believe. Like, I didn't get so good as I hoped that I would be. And uh, I o- always knew that I had a bigger future as a coach or now as an analyst. So, yeah. So uh, on your elite prospects, it says uh, Troja Jung- Jungby, which is in, it, it, you know, I've never actually been. So is it in Jungby or is it in Troja? Two, is it two towns or what yeah. is? Uh, I think the Troja is only for the hockey team and Jungby is the city. Okay, so and it's, it's like, really far south in Sweden, right? It's the middle part of a small land uh, there. And and uh, so how did you end up there? Because Kalmar, where you grew up, is is right there south, uh, right on the inside of Lake of uh, of uh, of uh, um, what's the Gotland and yeah, I say Irland. Öland. I, yeah. I've been gone so long, I don't even know. The, the, there's only two islands of Sweden. Yeah. Gotland and Öland. And I didn't even... Uh, but I, I've actually been to Öland on Öland's Brun, um, the, 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 the bridge over there. But Kalmar, kind of, a, kind of a neat small town. Not small town, but kind of medium-sized town, city. Yeah, yeah. And back uh, like 10 years ago when I... When I should uh, choose which hockey gymnasium I had uh, should go to, Kalmar was not as a good team as they are today. So they were like playing Division Two, which is like the four, fourth division over here. Yeah. So uh, uh, now they play in this hockey uh, Yeah, they the just got moved division. up. Um... Yeah, which is really fun. They've done a ter- terrific job there over the last years to move up the system it's nice yeah, to see a, them play at a high level yeah just a plug for the previous episode that we had in in april with uh with mange and anni safström with uh safström with skills and prehab um mange is the skills coach there in in kalmar and has done a great job and and um uh, it's gonna be fun i mean they're gonna have a tough time being the new guy in allsvenskan it's a completely different level than hoketan for sure um but was so when you went there was that uh was Troya Jungby was it considering uh NIU gymnasium it was uh, the year after I was going there 
Okay. So they got their NIU license like one year after I was going there. So yeah, you could say a bit of both. Yeah. And then uh, played your all the way up J20, got a cup of coffee in Hockeyall Svenskan, which is pretty good. Yeah, uh, it was it was a fun experience. No, no uh, shifts, but it was still a nice experience to move up uh, from the under eighteen team to to the men's team in that organization who, that you went. Do you remember who you played? Yeah, it was Rögle. Oh, uh, and they had a good team. I think they got promoted to SHL that year, but uh, and they had some good players, and it was a full house. So wow, yeah. Great experience. Yeah. All right, and then and then a couple of years um, uh, in Hockey Etan Halmstad. I mean, good teams uh, um, and uh, uh, you know, not small town teams. I see you played in Olofström there as well. Uh, good organization as well. A little bit on loan um, as well, but then. So, so what made you? So, so have you always been involved or in, kind of interested in coaching, or when did you get into thinking about? Was it kind of in that time period, or has that been? Have you been involved earlier as well? I wouldn't say I've been involved. Maybe like in under eighteen team when I was uh, hurt, uh, injured, I was on the bench sometimes as a. You no, know, since I was a captain of the team, I thought it was fun to still be involved in the games but uh, I know it's always been uh, in my head because my grandpa was a really really good soccer coach he coached like the Danish national teams and a lot of good teams in Sweden and in Europe so it's always been in my interest to and uh, to be a coach so he's my biggest idol so I always wanted to follow his path yeah how uh, so did you get take a lot of influence or kind of um ideas from him or or yeah not like this specific into the sport like the tactics and stuff but a lot of his influence on work ethic and uh, how you like talk to teams and i've been seeing him in these in big environments sometimes and i i know how hard he worked when it, even if we were there on vacation, he was still in front of that TV, watching games like of opponents and stuff. So that's amazing. I um, it's a little bit of a of a of a common a commonality that of different people that I've talked to is in their journey of how did they end up where they are and the and the value and the importance of mentorship and not necessarily what you say. Yeah. but how you live your life type of things and parents of course or grandparents in your case um played a big big role in that so so you got your first um so how did you get into the whole video coach side or was that like the first step of getting involved because i know you've done more than just video coaching and also helping yeah. with the teams but you know so if you're looking at your elite prospects profile uh, early on it's it's uh it's video coach and then assistant coach and and so on um uh, talk about that a little bit yeah so I, it was a bit of an accident uh i was uh, going to study to become a teacher and i uh, when you got your like uh, message where you want, where you should go i got into vecco and right away when i got to vecco i knew that i had would like to be involved in some uh, coaching role in uh, the hockey uh, in the hockey team. So I knew one guy in, who should start as an assistant coach for the under-18 team in Vecco Lakers. And uh, I just texted him and said I would be interested uh, to help them in any kind of way if they, if they had the needs. And he just texted me back and said that it, uh, the head coach wanted a video coach. So then another video coach in the organization from the under 20 team, Christopher Lingen, who still works for Vecco as an analyst. Uh, he taught me how to tag in dartfish and all that uh, stuff. So 
it was I had a bit of luck, but uh, I think I've done a pretty hard work as well over the years too. And, and that was Joel Ranmark, who was the head coach then, right? Yeah, exactly. And and then he moved up to 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 uh, Jueleftio. Is that did you kind of follow him there? Because I see that you you went to Jueleftio later. Yeah, I, I, many people think that, but it's actually opposite. I was going to Jueleftio before him. Oh, really? Because, yeah, because I texted Niklas in uh, Jueleftio, and he we talked a bit, and uh, I signed a contract for the under eighteen team there for two years. And Joel was still searching for uh, an opportunity to be assistant coach in the SHL. And uh, when that didn't happen, uh, I said to Niklas, uh, who searching for was searching for an under-20 coach, that Joel was available. And they talked, and now he's still there. So, yeah, kind of funny. Thank you very much. But I'm sure that you had that. That's cool to be able to have someone that you already know in the organization as well for for both of you. Yeah, it was uh, really good, both for him and me, and but also see new people that's really developing for you as a coach. Yeah. So it's interesting. One thing about that I see often is that the video coaches are the goalie coach. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a typical uh, thing in Sweden. I, I think that uh, goalie coaches have been... Some people like that role, and some people have just got it off economic yeah Yeah. we need someone to be we need someone to be the video coach you only work with three players we work with 25 (laughs) a little bit of that a little bit of that no but i i i I knew more more and more teams are like uh, developing to get more people involved in their organization like uh, hiring analysts and uh, i think Frölunda has a uh, video coach full time and been and he's been working there for like ten years. So I know uh, teams are looking at like expanding their organization. Yeah. Talk a little bit about it. I think this is a, a little a little side track here, but the difference in the different because you've played in the different levels of different organization, you've coached in different levels, and certainly when you've and and then also with the with the national team and, and and the resources that are out there. But, you know, you've got the big clubs like Vekre, Gelefteo, Rögle uh, that we've talked about. And then you have the smaller clubs like Troja, Ulofström, Halmstad, right? And, and there's a big difference between the level of, or, or, or the foundational, the amount of people that they can employ and so on. What does that mean, since this is about junior hockey here, but what does that mean for the junior player that comes into a team like Jueleftio versus like when you went to Troja originally, if you take your experience? I believe uh, the like morning sessions are the most uh, where it's most different. Yeah. Because in Jueleftio we had two full-time coaches on every team plus a goalie coach and plus a player development so we're like six coaches for two teams that means we can divide into smaller groups and still have good uh, specific education for each smaller group when i went to Troy Jungby, it was one full-time coach for two teams yeah and who had like and maybe two second year, but it was one first year. So that's the main difference, like resources. And then if you, if you, if then you can also say the next level down, you may not, you may have, you may not even have the skills training at all, or you may have perhaps a lower level or a less experience, or maybe it's the coach that have the team may also be doing the skills. Yeah, exactly. So limited resources and the ability to. So when you have now been coaching and 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 especially in the video side, what is it the the stuff that you're seeing? Do you see a big difference not just in the physical development, meaning the training that they're doing, but also the kind of the mental and the acuity and the 
hockey IQ from the players based off of those things? Uh, well, I think uh, the hockey IQ is not is not better. I think. Okay. You know, when I when I grew up, we always played on the street, like street hockey, just divided into two teams, and we could play for hours. Now kids go to like uh, skills camps and they do technical stuff, so they can shoot. Under eighteen player can shoot like fuck that I never could. Yeah. I, they have so good shots and they can hit one timers like you could see in SHL. But and they can do like these moves that yeah, you I didn't even could spell to but but I think the hockey IQ is uh, something you really have to work with uh, with these young players right now. So you see this and and like I said I grew up in Lexon and one of the things um, I mean, it's a pretty public thing. For example, Philip Forsberg, who who was playing in Lexon, grew up in Lexon, and in on the on the other side of the river, it was called a community called Okere, which is where his school was. And after school every day, everybody would all of his buddies would go to the rink, and it was a it was just a community rink in not even at the at the arena, but it was Okere's rink, and that's where. It, the buddies would go and and play. So uh, him and Oliver Ekman Larson and some others, they kind of came together. Johan Hedberg and they 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 created a a fundraiser there, there in Lexan and they created the uh, hockey um, the, the 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 arena of dreams, which was a lean to to the backside of the uh, of the uh, practice rink, and it was. In the summertime, it's a dry land rink, and in the wintertime, they flood it and bring the zam out, and they, and they, but but it's the rules were you're not allowed to have organized practices. It's just for yeah. the community to come and just play, and anybody can play. There's not a you can't book the ice. It's just kind of uh, that way. So I'm I'm bringing that up as a, as an example, and and you see some on social media, parents and communities that are setting up these smaller um, community rinks, not necessarily with boards, um, and like it simulates what happens up in Canada where you have, you know, pond hockey um, and so on. Talk a little bit about you, you mentioned kind of that, that what what's the correlation with hockey IQ with that that you've experienced? Well, it's decisions, right? So you have to based on the information you get, you have to make a decision. When you face like only a object that is not moving, you can choose whatever you want. It doesn't matter. But if you choose, if you're facing an object that's moving, you have to make a split se split second decision it has to be right otherwise you could be in trouble both physically and in the game as a result so how much does experience uh count into that with if you've never been in that environment of, of kind of chaos and working yeah. within the chaos you may be do you see slow thinking in that or or what because you may, or is it the physical? You're you're not able to move your body quick enough, or what? Or is it both? I believe it's slow thinking, maybe. Yeah. Or just you just uh, going your pace and not having the environment in your decision. That's a... So we had some. Um, I've had some conversations with Ted Soikinen, who plays. He's the skills guy with yeah. Zoo, uh, and Ted is probably. Uh, one of the best when it comes to that thinking fast yeah, and or fast thinking and how do I simulate that in now practices? So when you're a video coach, what's your, I'm assuming that you are part of the coaching staff and how much of, are, are, of your influence now comes into designing drills or scenarios based off of I, I would imagine that when you do video analysis, you identify here's the problems that we're having. Yeah, you could say that. When I, when you know, when I was coaching in Kolefti, we had a saying that we always 
play even strength or like we didn't do drills that was two on ones on open ice we didn't do three on two on small area games because we always wanted that pressure on you that had on the puck that was simulating to the games like we always do three on three when we play five on five it was always like five on oh or five on five it was not that we divided the drill into five on two five on three and then five on five we always play the game like five on oh or five on five and and had have you seen is that because you you didn't you didn't what what's the philosophy behind that it's just the amount of pressure and real life you we want you to practice in real life of how the game is played yeah simulate the game basically um, put the players in those situations that we think uh come into the game very often and yeah. uh, and when you play 5 on 5 that and just let the play roll after that simulated start you also get this flow that hockey is a lot of flow game you have to connect these uh, areas also that's really important so uh, let's flip this now to kind of your role as a video coach um that, since we're i know that you you do a lot more than just video coach but um let's talk about what's the main what's your job description as a video coach what's your main objective yeah that depends on which team you're working for and what coaching staff uh, has uh, uh, what they want out of you but uh, for like the under 20 team now with the national team i'm basically in charge of getting the video of every uh, game and practice and make sure that every coach has what they want in uh, regarding video. And uh, in the games, I tag the games and I come down to the to the intermissions and say what I think about what I see from upstairs and uh, make sure the coaches can watch power play, box play, and all all our scoring chances. And uh, after the games, I have. Uh, uh, responsibility of um, uh, static stats. Yep. So Statistics. I make sure to check uh, where our weaknesses and strengths are. And uh, like my main thing to watch is the scoring chances, how our scoring chances are up front and what we led against. So how does that differ with the national team versus, let's say, your pr prior roles uh, in in Vekkerleftio video coaching? Uh, so in Vekkerle and Kolefti, when you work with these players daily, it's more like a development mindset. So you talk uh, more about with the players uh, because the time frame is different. You know? Yes. So so. When, yeah, so you during have a tour yeah, during a tournament with the national team, the time frame is really small and you have like I know uh, the world championship uh, for juniors is seven games in nine days, I think. <laughs> so not too much information is going to uh, be able to get to the players. You just have to uh, prepare for the next game all the time. So uh, when we're talking about then the analytics portion and the, and the and gathering, so what are the tools that you're using? Because uh, I would imagine that the games that you're getting internationally may how do you, how do you get those the game footage? Is that going to be from all platforms wherever? Uh, so we um, always when we play tournaments, it's always like internal uh, devices. So they uh, tape the games and we get them from like our Dartfish system. But and we also but we also get the footage from uh, Sportlogic like after a couple hours. So we both both internal uh, with Dartfish and uh, on camera and uh, from Sportlogic. But there's not any um, friendly sharing. I give you mine and you give me yours. 
Well, it could be sometimes, but mostly not. Okay. And, you know, we had Speedio um, on before as a, and of course we've had, we've talked about Svensk Hockey TV, but so talk about Sport Logic and Darkfish. What's that? So Sport Logic is an AI company that uh, tag the games like uh, as a computer, not uh, manually. So we could get like a uh, couple thousand tags from the game uh, from them. So it's like it's like instead, but it, they do it automatically. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna and ask have, if, it, if it's similar yeah. to instead. It's similar, but it's much better and much more uh, stats. So do you d does that work where you have a game and you send it to them and they will do what yeah, you they want do. to have done? Yeah, they, I, I, we can ask Sportlogy to do many things, but uh, that's one of the things we make sure that they do, that they send the uh, individual shifts to the players Okay. an email. And what about... Every game. What's what about Dartfish? Is that is that the software that you use to kind of slice and dice? Yeah, that's what we use because uh, some of these places don't have internet connection, so that's where we use Dartfish. Uh, okay. Because you don't you can work with it offline, and uh, you could tag the games there. You could tag the practices and work in the software with uh, all the clips or. Uh, for practices and pre-scouts and everything. Okay. What about so? What are the key things that 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 you're tracking from from Sport Logic? Is it similar to kind of Instat where you have, you know, length of shifts and the stats of how many shots on goal and and but you get it more in a visual way yeah. too. And... Position time in different zones. You have uh, slots, shots, and. Uh... Uh, which players with ice, ice times and zone starts, fade softs. We, it's so many metrics that we look at. Okay. Any? Do you all utilize, have you been part of utilizing anything like wearables, uh, both from a positioning and from a physio standpoint? I don't know what you mean about that. Uh, like uh, the wearable devices. So uh, they're measuring heart rates. They're measuring... Um, blood sugar levels yeah and, yeah yeah. i didn't know no, if that... i i have never been involved in that but i only heard of them and some people that have used it to like uh, how they've been using so yeah it's, it's funny you know watching um oh gosh netflix you know M manchester city and and you know when you have unlimited funds and you can have you know it's all about optimizing the the performance of the athlete and how do we how do we make sure that the preparation matches the output? And, you know, when they're doing finger pricks yeah. at halftime to see what your blood sugar level is, is yeah. not just for games, but during practices and, and um, you know, oxygen consumption versus diet and sleep and heart rates and these type of things, pretty fascinating stuff, yeah. but um, not quite there yet with juniors. <laughs> no. All right. So um, what are the big things that you see then when you're analyzing? What's the big difference? Uh, what is it that you bring to the table? Let, let's, let's talk about development first of all, and then we can talk about kind of your role now and, and round out with, with the national team. But when you're analyzing and you're working with a, with a group of players, and it could be Let's start with the, with the young guys because you worked with J18s. They're coming from their clubs, just like you came from Kalmar to Troja. They may be coming from. So if you're working with Vekre, they may be coming from, uh, you know, a, a smaller town, and and they may never never have been looked at themselves and their and 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 their strides. What are the common things that you're pointing out? Uh, when you're working from a development standpoint with a group or an individual? It's mostly doing good things every day, like uh, practice and rep repetition. Like that's the main thing because that's the only way you get in better, like doing things more than others and doing it better. So 
basically like trying to motivate them to do as good as pos they possibly can every day. Which then translates into an increased effort level or, or because they're motivated and they're feeling good, they work harder? Yeah, sometimes it yeah. doesn't work all the time, but we try to motivate them with good examples. And uh, most of them that really like the sport, they also want like that. So, what about it the works J sometimes? What about the J20s? Same thing from a development standpoint. Now you're not really talking to a rookie, you're talking about a someone that is one or two years away from going pro. What's the What's the difference there in terms of the things that you're looking at there? It's maybe more like short-term goals where we're, where I want to be in like one year and what I what do I need to do to be there? Like some people have high goals, but their effort every day may not uh, live up to that. So uh, I think you need to be clear with what do you need to do every day to reach your goals? If you said you want to reach those goals. Yeah. That's a, that's a little surprising. It's not what I thought. I figured it would have been like, okay, you need to be working on, see your stride length here is not where it needs to be, or, or you, we need to be working about your techniques and, you know, you're kind of railroading and, or your gap isn't perfect or your shot, you know, see how your shot compared to someone else. But um that's yeah, yeah that's that's yeah I mean, that's the how that's step two like if i want to play a uh, defender in hockey al svenska next year what do i need to work on and how often do i need to work on that it's not enough to like do it once every month you have to do those things maybe every day to be able to play in hockey al svenska next year so what are some telltale signs of like what you're talking about, the effort level or the um, the intensity or whatever, how do you see that? I mean, because I, I would imagine that it, you, you have ways of being able to give examples of those type of things. I think it's quite obvious. I think you could, if you were in, there, in that arena as well, you could see, even if you don't know him, I think you could see if he goes 100% or not. So it's body language, right? Uh, basically, body language, yeah. But also, like, how interested are you? Are you when we have like meetings and and uh, how engaged are you by yourself when you do yeah. things by yourself? That's 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 really good. All right, switching now to so talk about now J twenty national team. Now we're not yeah. talking development. You're looking at opportunities to to uh win this game and capitalize yeah. it's a chess game right yeah and how do we how do we seek out weaknesses what do i have versus what they have um kind of thing right yeah so first of all it's a preparation thing where you have short time preparing your team but that work itself needs to be really good like making sure that everybody knew what we expect from them uh, on the field like this needs to be really clear because we don't have every week of practice to make sure that they uh, could uh, know know what they need to do but it's may it's like maybe three days and then they need to know this stuff that we want to how we want to play so we start there and then when we see where our own strengths and weaknesses are uh, from like um, analyzing our own game and from there we analyze the opponents and see where how we our game is compared to their game and then we can figure out a plan how we want to attack the game. Who, who do you typically, so I'm, I pulled up the staff here which you know pretty impressive um, staff with the J20 because the the goal here is you got national uh, the, the world juniors coming in Gothenburg in when is it December? Yeah, it's like a Christmas or around Christmas and New Year's. Yeah. So who do you typically out of this staff? Who do you work with the most? 
Is it Magnus Havili, the head coach, or is it more of the assistant coaches, or is it all of them as a team? It's all of them, but uh, for this tournament, I'll be working most with the head coach, and uh, and the D coach will work with the D coach and PK, and he will like do those divided, as they divided. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. So, what are do you already know? Have they already set the? They haven't set the final roster yet, right? No, we're going to. Uh, Czechia if for November and that's the like final tournament before and then we have a pre-camp and then we go Christmas New Year's so how and I would imagine it's the same thing for everybody else so how do you so you haven't it, it doesn't do any good to look at last year's Canada team um, they had Connor Bedard and Connor Bedard is not going to play in this tournament Individually, maybe not, but you can see like uh, a bit structured things that Team Canada always plays. They want to play fast. They want to move the puck up the ice as fast as possible. They don't uh, turn the puck home as much as maybe European teams do. So we can learn from that. And we faced Team USA like three times when we were there in the summer. So we have learned a lot from those games. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I'm looking at on this, on this roster, um, I mean, it's, it's a crazy roster. The amount of drafted players on Sweden is, is, is crazy. Um, you know, it's the best of the best in this tournament. So walk us through kind of the, the preparation now between now. So you got the tournament in Czechia in, in November. What's yeah. your, what's your timetable between now and the actual, so, so, so if we start with the end in mind, the goal is gold. Yeah, of course. But it's a tough thing, but you need to do everything you possibly can. So, yes. So, but you will be there too. Your, 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 your work does not end when the tournament starts. It's all the way up to, it could be the last overtime period in the gold medal game. Yeah, it could be like a coach's challenge in the final five minutes of the final. Then you need to be make sure you have the right footage and um, say the right words to the coaches, and make the right call. So, are you just like in the NHL? Do you have i? Are they allowed to have iPads on the on the bench and review plays? Yeah. Yes, they have. So they can do that. So you're so you're up there with your headphones and you're like, "Ooh, I saw this! Boom, put it in front of them." So because I, I, you know, as a coach, I know how you can't take your eyes off of stuff, but but for a yeah. second, so you're you're communicating, Magnus. Hey, you need to look at this. Yeah, Magnus, or uh, I think Jer uh, Jeron Dahlgren will have the the ear. Ex Lexan guy, of course. Yeah, of course. <laughs> No, that's good. That's gonna be. Uh, that's gonna be. But but then you are the eye in the sky. Are you watching your stuff on monitors? Are you watching? Because some of these are gonna be played in big arenas and yeah. But mostly here in Sweden, they have uh, that you check uh, the game live. But I know in North America, they have separate rooms where you sit in like a uh, in the locker rooms actually. In okay. front of the TV. So, but in Sweden, they always we always do live. So, what what do you prefer? Do you, so when you were watching that game, yeah. are you watching the monitor? Or are you watching the the actual live? I've I've actually never tried to do that in front of a TV in the locker room, but I would know I would prefer to do it live because you ha get that uh, hawk eye vision much better. And that's what you're used to from being a player and as coach, and right? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. If you're a if you're an Xbox NHL uh, 23 guy, maybe you you're more used to. <laughs> but if you're doing that, you're probably not going to be a video coach for the national team. I was a long time I played Xbox. I'd say. <laughs> yeah, I gave up when it when they added uh, two more buttons that. 30 years ago that's when i quit so <laughs> okay <laughs>
Well, it's going to be interesting. I think that it's, 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 um, to me, video analysis, I mean, lots of thoughts. Let's round out with this thought on, on, on where do you see the biggest, um, you know, some coaches or some people just think that there's way too much emphasis on on video analysis, and that that complicates things too much for players. And you know, they just need to focus on just working hard and not so much on video review. Well, I think that could be true in some cases because I think uh, a few coaches they have long video sessions like over 30 minutes going over every situation. I know that young coaches that have been working with video since the start, that they are really, uh, what do you say? They really make sure that these video sessions are short and clear message all the time. So they may, they could be like seven to 15 minutes and then people uh, in the team, they like the video sessions because they get something out of it. If you're in there for like 30, 40, 50 minutes, they're going to think it's really boring and they're going to say that they hate video. So I think it depends on who you talk to. Are you? Let me ask you this too, something that just came to my mind. The best of the best, how much time are they spending on an individual basis and what's the importance there of what you're talking about with sport logic or instat and watching their own stuff well they watch every shift of their game i, I know that but i think it's uh, important just to watch it uh, just to see where you can improve and also what good things are doing what things are working so what things are working and what could i improve next time i ha happen to get in this situation what yeah. what, I, what what i want to do yeah because sometimes it could be like you have a really really good feeling after the game man i played really good and then when they look at the video they're like uh i kind of messed up here 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 or the opposite i felt really bad and then when you look at the the data or the facts it may be no, i didn't play so bad uh it just this situation and that situation overshadowed so I, so my my feeling my self-worth goes down because of one or two situations, but 95% of the stuff was really, really good. Kind of yeah, I mean, if you look at Conor McDavid, he, he would never have a perfect game, even if he's the best player in the world. So you shouldn't be that hard on yourself on mistakes. It's only like things you can learn from. Yeah. No, it's going to be fun to kind of... Um, I, I, I'm I personally... I mean, when I was coaching, I... You know, at a low level, we were using, and we're talking about you, fourteen boys, and I thought that it was because kids are such visual learners. It really helped to show the things rather than to just talk, 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 talk. Because I realized they weren't listening, so let's show it. But you're right, five minutes. It may have been two scenarios, and that's it. That's all I could do. And then there were you lost them. So, uh, but as the professional level goes up, um, it is a tool It's not the be all end all, but it's a tool in your toolkit, just like a power skate instructor or, you know, a health, you know, strength and conditioning physio, um, diet and, and everything else. Um, you, you, it's a component that if you don't do it, you're probably missing opportunities. Um, yes. So let's finish up here. Two things. Um, we have a um, partnership with Target Aid. I mentioned a little bit. So we have an emphasis on Klubben i mit the, the the club or the team in my heart that we want to highlight as in under our Target Aid profile. What's your which team is uh, do, do would your team your team be? Well, it, it'd be my youth club and my home time Kalmar, I think. That's awesome. We will make sure that that uh, you, ha you you will have a little subsection for Kalmar under there, and uh, I'm sure that um, that we can uh, help promote that as well. So, last thing. Uh, 
you're 29, you're, you're a few more years wiser than when you were 17. If you met yourself at 17, uh, so back then, Troya Jungby days, what would you, you didn't have the experience you have now. What advice would you give yourself if you met yourself and sat there on the bench, no one's looking, and uh, what advice would you give yourself? I probably would say that, uh, like I said before to you when you, when we talked about juniors, like what are my goals and what do I need to do to reach those goals? And maybe ask people who have reached these goals, maybe try to get in touch with them and like, what did you do when you, do, when you were 18 or 17 in those years? So like get the f real facts about what it's... Uh, Really it takes, yeah. yeah. I think it's great, and that's the part about mentors that the, the the folks that really succeed when they can see, you know, an, an example is the kids of professional athletes that live and they're surrounded by this environment. They know what it takes. They see it every day. It's really difficult for, and that's why it's so impressive for for kids that didn't grow up and. And didn't know what it took, uh, and they figured it out on their own. It's even, but it it is much easier when you have that playbook in front of you, and it's easier to follow along um, than to figure it out on your own. So, uh, Jacob, thank you for coming on. It's been educational and informative, which is the objectives of this uh, of this podcast. I'm gonna go check out Sport Logic and Dartfish and 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 learn a little bit more about that. But more importantly, uh, kind of wet my appetite. I know we're still early and we still got a long ways till World Juniors, but since it's on home turf, um, uh, what's your prediction, lastly? We're going for gold, of course, but you never know. Yeah, I, lo I love it, love it. Thank you, Jacob, and uh, we'll stay in touch for sure. Yeah, thank you.